Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Amen. Are you glad to be in church Sunday morning at 9.30? Would you say amen? amen. You know, I wasn't here at 9.30. I, I thought church today started at 8.30. This is true. I showed up an hour early to church and I looked around. I said, where is everybody? How many of you think the pastor should know when church starts? How many of you agree with that? It freaked me out, man. It really did. I'm like, what's going on? I'm late to church, rushing in from the coffee shop. And sure enough, it starts at 930. Have you ever, have you ever come to church at the wrong time before? Yeah, okay, some of you have. Some of you didn't raise your hand. I was looking for it because I know you have. Amen. <laughs> Today, we continue our sermon series entitled, Help is on the way. This is part two of a four-week planned sermon series. And I really did. I planned out each and every one of these through time in prayer and study of the Word of God months ago. But something happened that rarely ever happens to me. On Monday, when I was in preparation for this sermon, I was planning on preaching about David and his uh, uh, relationship with his son Absalom having to do with help is on the way, but God, in our per- my personal walk with him, my time in studying the Bible and in time in prayer, God made it very clear to me to change the passage I was going to preach on and to change the direction completely of the sermon. That, that rarely ever happens. First thing I felt to say to the Lord when he said, you need to change the sermon was, no, because <laughs> I already know what I want to preach. And then the Lord made it very clear to me, it's not my job to tell him what I preach. Can I get an amen right there? (laughs) So it's really weird to me because typically I know weeks ahead of time where I'm preaching from, but God changed it all up. And now instead, we're going to be preaching from Daniel chapter 10 about the, the man Daniel. How many of you know Daniel? Raise your hand. You know Daniel? Now, some of you are thinking, oh, I know this one, Daniel in the lion's den. No, that's not the one we're going to look at. Daniel chapter 10 takes place after, uh, or Daniel chapter 10 uh, takes place uh, apart from that specific story. This is a story that takes place when Daniel is almost 90 years old. This is not the young man who at the age of 15 was taken as a captive out of his homeland. If you want to look at it, it's Daniel chapter 10. We're going to read verses 10 through 14. We're also going to skip around in the chapter a little bit. And what we're going to see in this story is fascinating. There are demons in this story. There's spiritual warfare in this story. There's Gabriel and Michael the archangel fighting against demons in the story. There there are three weeks of stress and prayer and waiting. It really is a sermon about being patient and waiting upon God. Daniel chapter 10, if you look at it, verse 10 is where we'll begin, and then we'll pray after I read and explain the text. It says, and behold, a hand touched me. Well, let me explain what's happening. Daniel, in the midst of the story, is flat on his face before God. Have you ever prayed on your knees? Have you ever been so deep in prayer, you're not just on your knees, you start lying prostrate on the ground? Well, that's what's happening with Daniel. Daniel's been praying for three weeks now. He's lying flat on his face against the ground. It says, and a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. It literally pulls him up, and now no longer is he laying there. He's now on his hands and his palms. To understand this verse, skip back to verses 2 and 3. It gives context. Look at verses 2 and 3 of chapter 10. It says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. He was in mourning. He was, he was really upset. Uh, now, I don't know where you're at this morning. Hear me. I don't know where you're at emotionally. I don't know where you're at spiritually. You might be right now in the midst of a mourning phase. Maybe it's a true death. Maybe it's a death of a dream. Maybe it's a death of an opportunity. Maybe it's a death of a friendship. I'm not sure where you're at, but maybe you're in that moment of mourning. Or if you're not, you know what it is to be mourning. That's where Daniel is. The Bible says in verse 3, I ate no pleasant bread. And let me explain why Daniel is so um, discouraged, some would say depressed, in the state of mourning. Daniel is 85 years old at this point, and he's been praying for something for the last three weeks. You see, when Daniel was a boy at the age of 15, 
He was taken as a captive out of his homeland in Judea. He was taken as a captive where he was all the way to the land of Babylon and his entire city was destroyed, his entire country was taken over, and his entire family was gone. As a 15-year-old boy, he had nobody but a few friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to trust in. And that's all he had. Now, this is 70 years later. And now Daniel is an old man, and he's, he's sitting there in his palace because through a lot of circumstances, he had become a very important person in Babylon. And three times a day for 70 years, he had been praying for God to bring the people back to the land of Jerusalem. And now finally, after 70 years of prayer, a delegation was sent from Babylon back to Jerusalem, and they were going to start rebuilding the temple under a man named Ezra. The problem is, Daniel got word from all those that had returned to Jerusalem that the temple that was being rebuilt, construction had stalled, and there was no work being done. And so now Daniel got on his knees and he began to pray, oh God, you're bringing us back to the land of Jerusalem, please God. Help us rebuild the temple. And after the first day, he got up. And then later on in the afternoon, he prayed a second time. And then later on in the afternoon, he prayed a third time. And though Daniel constantly prayed three times a day for his entire life, now Daniel was so deep in prayer, it was very an unusual amount of prayer. Look at what it says in verse 3. And Daniel said he ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine into his mouth. He was fasting. He wasn't drinking. There was all this that he was going through. Neither did he anoint himself at all for three whole weeks were fulfilled. He didn't take a bath. He wasn't eating. He wasn't drinking. All he did for 21 days was pray, oh God, give me an answer. Hear me. Have you ever been in prayer for so long you begin to wonder if God is going to answer your prayer? Maybe if I was more spiritual, maybe if I was a hero like the heroes of the Bible, then God would answer my prayer immediately. But Daniel waited and waited. It goes on. Look at the story. It says in verse 11, and he said unto me, the angel finally comes and picks him up off the ground after three weeks of prayer and says, Daniel, look at me. Look at what it says in verse 11. He said unto me, oh, Daniel, oh, man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. The angel says, hey, God sent me to answer your, answer your prayer. Un uh, understand and to chasten thyself before God. Thy words were heard and I am come for thy words. He basically says this, Daniel, you've been praying, and the moment you prayed, I want you to understand, God sent me to answer your prayer. Let me say that again. The angel says to Daniel, the moment you prayed, God sent me to answer your prayer. The big thought of the sermon today is found right in this verse, and that is this. Christian, hear me. The moment you pray, Help is on the way. You say, then why did it take three weeks? The story goes on. The angel explains, verse 12. Then said he unto him, fear not, Daniel, for this from the very first day that thou didst send thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come before thy words. Verse 13. I was on my way, but something happened. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. One and 20 days he surrounded me. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? What's happening here? According to the scripture here, the Bible says the angel was sent by God to give an answer to Daniel, but all of a sudden, as he did, somebody named the prince of Persia stopped him. You say, who's a prince of Persia? What kind of a king or a prince is so powerful they can fight against an angel? Well, the answer to that is this. This is speaking of a demon. Just as we have angels that, that walk with God and stand for us, so there are demons that walk with Satan and stand against us. The Bible here talks here about a territorial spirit. An angel or a demon, I should say, that is so powerful, the devil has given him control over an entire region. 
And Daniel's prayer was so important that God sent his messenger Gabriel to give him the answer. But all of a sudden, this very important demon called the Prince of Persia came and for 21 days he stopped him. Look at what it says. But lo, Mike, uh, uh, the Prince of Persia stopped him. But the Bible says that Gabriel calls for backup. A guy named Michael, uh, Michael, he is a prince of the angels. He is the archangel, the Bible tells us, came to help me and remained there with me uh, to fight, uh, remain there with me, the kings of Persia. Look at verse 14. So we fought, and then it says, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet thy vision is yet many days. I read through this passage, and this is what I think. I think, what? That's what I honestly, every time I read through this passage, I'm like, I've read it through many times. I've studied it deeply. And every time I walk away thinking, that's crazy. A story about a man who is an old man, but he loves God. He's been walking with God for years. He prays and says, God, I need an answer. And an angel comes to give him the answer. And an angel gets stopped by a bunch of demons. And they have a spiritual war for 21 days. And the entire time, Daniel continues to pray, God, give me the answer. Give me the answer. Gabriel calls for backup. I need Michael and the rest of the angels. They fly in. And now there's a big fight in the spiritual realm. This is all happening happening invisibly and we can't even see it but around us that battle rages finally Gabriel's able to slip through the lines get all the way to Daniel and give Daniel the answer and so I state as I begin the sermon the main concept once again of the day in the moments you pray please believe it no matter how long you wait no matter how patient you have to be in the moment you pray help is on the way that's what the teaches us today. Father in heaven, over these next 30 minutes, give us insight into your word. Give me an opportunity to give clear explanation, illustration, and application. Help us to see how these truths can change our lives and change the world we live in. In the, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Waiting. Waiting is the worst. How many of you agree? How many of you are impatient like Josh is? I know some of you are impatient. So am I. The worst is when you're in the car waiting for the family to come. How many of you know this? How many of you know what that's like? Some of you dads raise your hand quick, man. You're like, relax. How many of you get impatient even at the microwave? Have you ever... <laughs> Have you ever done this? You pop a burrito in there, you press the buttons. You're like, come on, two minutes for a burrito. This is ridiculous. <laughs> we are impatient uh, as a people. Uh, it was early, not, not too long ago. It was early. I was driving my kids to school and all that construction that was happening over in the Mountain's Edge area, driving me nuts, driving me crazy. I wanted to drive down Rainbow. Rainbow was blocked off. So I had to turn right, go over to Cactus and uh, cactus and, um, and rainbow go over the bridge. It's early in the morning. There's no one there. No one. I can't stress this point enough. <laughs> My kids are there getting ready. They're all ready for school. We're listening to SOS radio, God's music. <laughs> I'm a godly man. <laughs> and the light is red and nobody is there. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm God's man, listening to God's music, taking God's children to God's school, <laughs> in God's car, in God's city. And the light is red. And nobody is there. And I'm like... So I go. <laughs> no, hey, no, that, no, that is not a fair reaction. That's not fair. You bunch of hypocrites. It's true what they say. Christians in church, I run the red light. Immediately, my three kids, oh, <laughs> Dad, you broke the law. I said, we're all sinners, kid. It's true. We are sinners, all of us. We got to school on time, though, so we're all right. Patience. 
So we pray, don't we, as Christians? We pray, God, you got to take care of this. God, you got to do this. God, you got to help me out here. God, you got to help. And then all of a sudden, we are sent to wait. Sometimes as we pray, we wait for days. Sometimes we pray and we wait for weeks. Sometimes we pray and we wait for years. Now, the new, and don't take offense by this, but the immature Christian, the person who's just new to Jesus, they can get very, very impatient with God. Come on, God, I thought you pray and then the answer comes. And then you learn, no, we wait for God's timing. So here's the question today. What do we do while we're waiting? You're standing there at the microwave. You've got 120 seconds left. What do you do? (laughs) You're sitting there at the red light. What do you do? You pray to God and you say, God, when? What do you do while you're waiting? I'm telling you, friend, God has put this on my heart, and I, it might it might be just for you. Today we're going to see from the story of Daniel three things that you must do while waiting upon God. Are you ready for it? If you're ready, say amen. amen. Number one, you must, while waiting upon God, number one, you must be still and Okay, pastor, tell me what to do. The first answer is nothing. The first answer is don't do anything. Just stop, stop, just stop and wait. Be still and know what? Be still and know that God is in control. Look what it says in verse 12 of our text. It says, fear not, Daniel. The angel comes to him and says, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand... He says, from the very first day that you began to pray and to chasten thyself before God, understand when it says chasten, it's an old English word. It means to humble yourself. He wasn't saying hurt yourself. He's saying the moment you began to humble yourself before God, the very day that you began to pray and humble yourself before God, what does he say? Thy words were heard, and I am sent for thy words. Hear me, friend. Listen. Here's the question. What have you been praying for? I know your hearts. I know so many of you so dearly. And I know some of you have been praying for. What have you been praying for, friend? I pray through those connection cards that you fill out every week. And some of you have the same prayer request on there for weeks and months and years. And by faith, you keep praying for the same thing. God bless your faith. What have you been praying for? And still the answer hasn't come. Is it healing? Is it advancement? Is it for that job? Is it for that child? Is it for that relationship? What is it that you say, God, I'm kind of getting tired here of waiting upon you. I've been praying. God, what do I do? What have you been praying for? Here's what you're supposed to do. According to Psalm 46 and verse 10, it says, be still. And know that I am God. We live in a fast-paced, loud society. So quietness and stillness we are uncomfortable with. It's odd, isn't it? Say something, do something, put on music, do something else. We've got to go forward. We've got to do something, turn something on. Why? Because it's so hard for us to just be still and know that God is in control. How many of you today believe that God is in control? Say amen. amen. How many of you also believe it's hard to be patient? You say, Pastor, I've been waiting. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of waiting. I'm exhausted by all this waiting. I don't think I can make it. According to Isaiah 40 and verse 31, those who are tired, look at what it says. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord. Go back to that verse. I love that verse. Look at verse 40. Even the youth. You say, I'm tired. Even the young people get tired. Can I get an amen? (laughs) 
my, my, <laughs> my, wife, my wife and I, um, <clears throat> we go to a CrossFit gym, and when I say my wife and I do, she goes and I go twice a year. She, <laughs> when, how many of you know Akeem? How many of you know, you know Akeem? Akeem's young, nice guy, in shape, right? So I say to Akeem when he first started here about a year ago, I said to Akeem, hey, Akeem, why don't you go to CrossFit with us? We can spend a little time working out together. And I'm thinking this, Akeem's going to get there, and he is going to blow us out of the water. Now, if you've never been to a CrossFit gym, let me explain it like this. We live here. Hell is here. <laughs> it's very close, you see. <laughs> They share a zip code. <laughs> so I said to Akeem, Akeem, do you want to go? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go. So I said, okay, here he comes, right? Akeem is going to come. And man, we started the workout. We began with kettlebells. And we began with jumping jacks. And we began with all these things. And about 20 minutes, this was one of my favorite moments last year. <laughs> <laughs> about 20 minutes into the workout, I look over, and my wife has on her back rack, I mean, a lot of weight. And she's just going down, man. She's going down. She's doing it. And I'm, I'm, I'm so proud. I look over, and you know what Akeem is doing? Akeem's on the floor. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh, oh. By the way, you think I'm making that up? You ask him. You know what verse came to mind? This one. Even the youth shall be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. I said, praise God, I'm getting older, but I'm stronger than Akeem. Amen, right there. <laughs> You say, but I'm getting tired. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Even the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, they that wait patiently upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. Here we see from the word of God, the thing we ought do is be still and know. Think of all those in the Bible who had to wait upon God. David was anointed to be king, and he had to wait 17 years to be the king. Moses was called by God to lead the people of Israel out. He had to wait 40 years in the desert before it happened. Joseph was called by God, and he gave him a dream that God would get, make him a great leader. But then he was thrown into prison, and he had to wait years for that dream to come true. That's what the stories of the Bible are. We trust God through the waiting. Number one, what do I do in the meantime, pastor? Number one, be still and know. Number two, number two, fight on through prayer. The first thing you do is nothing. The first thing you do is just stop. Stop freaking out. Stop stressing out. Stop worrying with anxiety. Just be still and trust God. The second thing you do is you better fight. But you need to fight through prayer. Look at what Daniel does. The Bible says in verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. The angel said, hey, this big demon, this big, jo big guy demon, man, he came to stop me. You say, how did that work? One angel fighting against an a, a demon? I don't know. All I know is there was a spiritual warfare taking place. The Bible explains a little bit more. It kind of gives us a, pick, a peek behind the invisible veil between the physical world and the spiritual world. It says, the king of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 20, uh, one in 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, that is the archangel, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. That is, he began, that he began to fight with all of the demons, not just from the king of, or that lead demon, but all of the demons began to fight against him. So here's the question. What did Daniel do? while the big spiritual warfare was going on, what did Daniel do? <laughs> kept praying. The reason he kept praying is because Daniel knew all the battle that was going on around him. True or false? False. He did not know until the angel told him all that was going on around him. Look at me now, look at me. The temptation is to stop praying 
because we don't see the battle that's raging all around us. I don't know how it works, but we get a very clear idea through Scripture that as Daniel continued to pray, it gave the spiritual forces of God strength to fight against the evil forces of the devil. My question to you is this, are you fighting on through prayer? Keep praying. Here we get so much clarification of what Jesus is talking about in the Gospels when Jesus said, keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. If you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. If you'll knock on the door, it shall be open unto you. Don't stop asking. Be impotent in your asking. Continue to pray. Keep praying, keep praying, Jesus said. For your Father in heaven will hear us. The problem is sometimes when we pray, we, look, sometimes when we as Christians talk to God, in, in its place, God gives us silence. What will you do in the face of heaven's silence? It may last for weeks years what will you do Daniel kept praying see Daniel had been involved in a cosmic spiritual conflict and didn't even know it and the Lord was using some of the highest angels to answer his prayer here's the thought that I want you to think through is there conflict around you right now between the powers of darkness and the powers of light if the thin veil hiding the invisible realm were slightly withdrawn, would we see a titanic opposition against you? If that's true, why is it that we don't get on our knees and beg God and continue to pray? You say, Pastor, I thought this sermon was about patience. It is. And the, one of the only responses to dealing with impatience is prayer. Prayer. Look at what 2 Corinthians, some of you say, well, I wish I could do more than pray. Look at what 2 Corinthians says. It says, for though we walk in the flesh. How many of you here are um, still alive physically? Say amen. amen. I'm not always sure in my, when I preach. I'm not always sure. <laughs> if you're physically alive here, you are in the flesh. That's what it means. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Though we are physical, physical beings, we don't war physically, Christians. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly or carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He's telling us that the weapons we have are not physical weapons. You say, man, I wish I had a big sword to fight a demon. You don't need a sword to fight a demon. You need the word of God to fight a demon. Say, man, I wish I had some big gun to fight off a prince of Persia. No, you don't need a gun to fight off the prince of Persia. What you need is prayer to fight off the prince of Persia. Do you see? This is what the word of God is saying. And sometimes we just need to look. Listen, we need to just pray through the situation. Keep praying, Christian. Look at me. Keep praying. Do you hear me? Keep praying. Look, I know it's been a while, but keep praying. You say, but I've been praying for weeks. Keep praying. I've been praying for months. Keep praying, but I've been praying for years. Keep praying. But what should I do then next? Keep praying. You say, but how do I fight? Keep praying. But what do I do? Pray. Pray. Daily. All day. Pray. It reminds me of the story of Jacob. Do you remember the story of Jacob in the Bible? The Bible says Jacob, a trickster, started walking down the river one day in the middle of the night. He could not sleep. You ever been there? Just can't sleep? He has so much going on in his mind. He's not sure what to do next. He's walking down this river, and in the middle of the night, he sees somebody, the angel of the Lord. Now, I don't know how you would respond if you met an angel of the Lord. I know how I would respond. I would fall on my face and say, oh, that's what I would do. <laughs> maybe not you. Maybe you're awesome. Look at Jacob. He's insane. Jacob says, let's fight. 
In the story, Jacob says, let's wrestle. He begins wrestling the angel of God. The angel says, let go. Now, if you're wrestling an angel next time, <laughs> and the angel says, let go, I would suggest you do so. Jacob does not because he is insane. He says, let go now. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I got to tell you, he was insane, but that man had faith. Some of us need to just hold on to that prayer and not let it go. I know what it is to wrestle, because clearly I am an athlete. <laughs> That's so rude, see? As soon as I say it. I'm not much of an athlete, you know that, but I, I did wrestle in college, I did. Now don't get you know, too excited, it was for my fraternity, and they were looking for somebody in my weight class, we had nobody that small or scrawny. <laughs> and so they came to me, they literally approached me, the leaders of my fraternity said, hey, would you like to wrestle? I said, me? And they said, yeah, would you like to wrestle? They, I said, sure, they said, how much do you weigh? I, and I told them, they said, perfect. We need somebody that's 60 pounds, you know, whatever it was. It was, it was sad, it was sad. And so I did. I, I, I remember I went to every practice. Every practice, they, they taught me different things, and, and I didn't often have a wrestling match, but when I did, I had, I had a total of, um, I had a total of two. <laughs> I won the first one, I lost the second one, so my wrestling career is 50%. It's not bad. <laughs> Pretty good. One of the things I remember them teaching me is, is, you know, how to hold, you know, you need certain holds, and then when you have the hold, don't let it go until you can get a better hold, like just hold, just keep holding with your legs and your arms and your teeth, not that, but hold. <laughs> so this lesson came very valuable to me because I was in my dorm, and um, across the dorm from me, across the hall, there was a, a giant lived there. <laughs> <laughs> To me, he's a giant. I remember we'd go over. I was in, the, in their room the night before with my brother. We were just hanging out. And this man, I, I don't know. He had to be 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, something like that. And to me, four foot two, anything that's above six is pretty much a giant. And I see this man, and we're talking and stuff, and I look down at his cleats. And his cleats are like, you know, like size 15 or 16, like big shoes. And, it, you know, I, I, looked, I saw him, and I just like, I started look, just, you know, like, what? that's crazy. And he noticed me looking at him. This guy was a big dude, kind of a jock kind of a guy. And he said, hey, why are you looking at my shoes? I said, oh, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Mind your own business. I said, all right. Don't hurt me. The next day, I was in my dorm room. True story, I got a knock at the door. Opened up the door, and it was the giant. And he had two friends with him. He did not look happy. Are you here to see my brother? <laughs> no, I'm here to see you. I said, really, why? He said, did you take my cleats? Now, I'm the type of person who wants to avoid that kind of thing. Ultimately, I don't want to get hurt. But I'm also the type of person who happens to know the wrong thing to say at the right time. <laughs> Did you take my cleats? I looked up and I said, yeah, I took them so I could use them as a raft just in case there's a flood. <laughs> he said to me, he said to me, are you getting smart with me? I said, I would definitely not try to get smart with you. I would not do that. <laughs> Wrong thing to say. He, this is true, he picked me up like this and put me on his shoulder. I grabbed my arm, the only thing I could do was remember from wrestling, I grabbed my arm around, I held onto his neck as hard as I could, put my arm around his neck as much, I mean it's like this. And I remember thinking, if I let go, I'm going to die. And he <laughs> fell forward on me, bam, right into the ground. And the whole time I'm holding onto his neck, and I'm thinking, if I let go, he's like, let go, let go. And I'm thinking, no, I can't let go, you're going to kill me. <laughs> yeah. 
I held on for so long until the dorm supervisor showed up and <laughs> saved my scrawny little hide. Thank God. It's true. It's a true story. Some of us need to hold on to the prayer that we've been praying as if our life depended on it. Your health, the relationship, that child, that parent, that job, that opportunity, and you keep thinking to yourself, it'll never happen, I'm just gonna give up, and you fall right into the trap of the devil, and what I'm saying is fight on through prayer. Here's the third thing you must do while waiting, and we'll be done. The third thing you must do is you must, you must, you must anticipate the miracle. You have to believe that the prayer will be answered. Pray with faith. Look what the angel says to Daniel in verse 14. Now I am come to make thee to understand what shall befall thy people in the latter. I have finally shown up to tell you what's going on in Jerusalem and that everything's going to be okay. It's just on God's timetable. The angel goes on to explain, and we won't take time to study it this morning for sake of time, but that Daniel's people would rebuild the temple and that the Messiah that Daniel was waiting for would come. How many of you thankful Messiah did come? Say amen. amen. How many of you thankful Jesus came? Say amen. amen. See, Daniel was, was concerned if the temple doesn't get built, is Messiah going to come? God, you've got to do this. So he's praying and he's praying and he's praying. Here's a question, true or false, true or false. True or false. When I ran that red light, I broke the law. True or false? True. Relax. Not one false. I really thought somebody would help me out. True. I broke the law. The kids were right. Okay, so this did not happen. Suppose I ran the red light, and when I did, those little cameras that our city is so fond of <laughs> took a picture of me running the red light. Suppose that happened. They would do what? Send me a ticket. Send me a ticket. Then I get the ticket in the mail. Do I deserve the ticket for my sin? Yes or no? Yes. Well, sure. The Bible says we're all sinners, and because of our sin, we deserve punishment. Do the crime, do the time. Should I deserve a ticket? Of course I should do the ticket. By the way, this audio recording and video recording is no admission of guilt. <laughs> Story. Maybe I'm making it up. Yes, I deserve the ticket. Suppose this has not happened, but suppose I got the ticket, and instead of paying the ticket, my thought was this. My thought, I know what I'll do. I leave my house early in the morning, go to the same stoplight, no one's around, and it's green. But instead of going, I decided to stop. <laughs> hoping that the city will take a picture of me. Because then my good deed would outweigh my bad deed, and then I wouldn't have to pay the ticket. Does that make sense? Why doesn't that make sense? Because we know inherently, just because you do one thing good and one thing bad doesn't mean it cancels it out. You do the crime, you're in trouble. you got to pay the ticket. The Bible says we're all sinners because of our sin. We're damned. We deserve to go to hell. We have to pay that fine. You say, all of us? All of us. But here's the reality. Someone came and paid your ticket. His name is Jesus. He died upon the cross for your sins. Here's the reality. You can't make up for it by your own good works. You'll fail every time. Jesus died for your sins so that you would not have to. If you put your faith in him, he will save your soul and forgive your sins because it's been paid for. Daniel anticipated that miracle. He believed with his entire heart that this would take place. This is what Pastor James in the, in the book of James says in James chapter 1 and verse 6. He says, but let the person who's praying ask in faith, nothing wavering. That means don't be double-minded in this. Don't doubt when you pray. For he that wavereth is like a wave that in the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He's saying, as you pray, just pray in faith. We have a guy in our church, his name is Tyler. I love Tyler. 
How many of you know Tyler? You know Tyler. Kevin knows Tyler. Is Tyler in this service or the next? Next, next service, because he's not one of the good ones. <laughs> All the good ones come to this one. <laughs> Some of you are like, hmm, well, uh, it's a lie, just joking. Tyler, um, Tyler moved to Las Vegas. It's a really interesting story. Some of you may not know, Tyler actually moved to Las Vegas just to be part of this church. That's his story. It's amazing to me. Praise God for it. By the way, he's been a huge blessing to this church. Helped take it to the next level in a lot of ways and will in the future, I know. But Tyler, when he got here, had no job, had no friends, had nothing. And uh, don't laugh, that's not nice. He has <laughs> lots of friends now. Tyler said to me, Pastor, pray for me to get the right job. I need a right job. Pray for me to get a right job. He tried a couple jobs, didn't work for him. Pastor, pray. I'm praying for a job. I started getting worried for Tyler. I sat down. I said, Tyler, what are you looking for? He said, oh, I'm praying for a specific kind of job. I said, what specifically? He said, well, I got it in mind. I know exactly what I want. I said, why don't you just, you know, kind of, you know, just take a job. He's like, oh, Pastor, I trust your counsel. I remember him looking at me across from eggs as we're sitting there at a restaurant. He said, but I know what job I want, and I'm praying for it. I remember thinking, you dumb kid, you know. <laughs> Listen, you'll be surprised who will judge you when you, by faith, have prayer and truly believe. Tyler, a few weeks later, said, hey, pastor. I said, what? He said, you know that job I'm praying for? I said, yeah. He said, I think I'm going to get it. I remember thinking, I remember thinking, probably not. <laughs> I know, hey, look, I'm just being honest. I'm up here telling you exactly my thoughts and my heart, and I'm wicked. A couple weeks later, he called me and said, I got it. I said, what? I said, I got it. If you ask Tyler, it's his dream job. He's a tour guide that takes people from Las Vegas out to the Grand Canyon every day. Every day on Facebook, there's a new selfie of him in some cool location. <laughs> Hashtag, I love my life. Look, pray believing. That's what Jesus told us to do. Look at Matthew. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into sea, and it shall be done. He's saying miracles happen when you pray, believing, believing, believing. I asked Jason and Ashley if I could share their story. They said I could. Many of you know them long-time faithful members of our church. They had been praying for three to four years that God would give them children and nothing. There were times they would come into my office and they would literally break down in tears. And they would say, oh, we're praying that God will give us children. We don't know why God won't give us children. We look at others who have children we see people getting pregnant all around us. We see others who joke about the children that they have. We see people who have children and are blessed with children who don't take care of their children. Why won't God answer our prayer for three years, for three years? And then God allowed them to conceive. And the entire church celebrated. They're pregnant. They're going to have the baby. This is what we've been praying for. And within a few months, they lost that child. This week, I contacted Jason and Ashley, and I asked them, how did... What were the feelings you were feeling during that time? And they said this, Ashley said, in that moment you feel hopeless because you feel like God is listening but you don't think he's listening to you. And then you constantly remind yourself he is listening but then you believe he's not listening. Have you ever been there? Have you ever heard the silence of heaven? I said, but what did you do? What did you do? This is what Ashley said. It was beautiful. She said, 
I felt at peace because I knew that God had a big plan for us. If you go to Jason and Ashley's house right now, you'll see it's a mess because they have children. <laughs> I suppose every home with the children is a mess. <laughs> with a beautiful nine-month-old and a four-year-old. Four-month-old. Four nine-month-old and a four-month-old. And God has blessed them through the fostering system, and I asked them, what are they feeling like now? They said they feel like God has finally answered the prayers they've been praying all along. I said to them, I said, so what's next? They said, well, what's amazing is that one of the children whom we're fostering, their parents are pregnant, and they met with us several times, and they want to, in the hospital when the baby is born, give that child immediately over to us. The caseworker in charge of the case stated this, I've never in my entire career seen a couple so ready to give their brand new baby over to another couple. They're going to be adopting this child in the next few months when the child is born. Just last night, Jason and Ashley were out with this couple. And as they were with them, they began to share the gospel and invite them to church. Before they even invited them to church, the couple said, hey, you go to church every Sunday. Do you think maybe we could come with you some Sunday? How many of you in this room understand this truth that maybe God is in control and maybe his plan is taking root? Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Friend, keep praying. That's what Daniel did. And what I'm asking you to do the same thing. There are two things that I'll ask you to do as we close in our sermon today. Two. Number one is this. If you're not yet a Christian, repent and receive Christ as your Savior. If you've not yet received Christ, call upon him right now to be your Savior. And number two, if you are a Christian, be still, wait, and pray upon God. Let's go in prayer. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world. 